All right, well, thanks for being here this morning. We're going to talk about a sepsis. Kind of a big topic, I think a very interesting topic. Because it's so big, we've got part two coming this afternoon. Anyone in their departments doing early goal-directed therapy for sepsis? Yeah, lots of hands, and lots of people are being pushed this direction. It's a great idea, and it really does work. What we need to do is dissect why it works. And just like so many things in medicine that we see, when something works, even with one study, Manny River's study, in 2001, this works, the train leaves the station, and it never stops, not asking any more questions. And what we need to do, and what's starting to happen now, almost 10 years later, is we're asking the question, why does this work? And do the components of early goal-directed therapy really work? What is your favorite food? Favorite? Your, yeah, don't think about it long, just throw something out. Pizza. Pizza for you. How about for you, Janice? I'm thinking it's not pizza. Well, seeing it is, but usually it would be um, a Siamese stir fry. Okay, so I didn't pick an easy one, but all right. <laughs> if we added, <laughs> I've learned something here. Um, after, so if we did early goal directed therapy for sepsis and we added pizza and we added Siamese stir fry, I, have no, I know what stir fry is, adding the Siamese component to it. I'm thinking cats and I don't like that, <laughs> but I just, but anyway, if that's what we like, we add that in there, would early goal-directed therapy for sepsis and the sepsis bundle be any less effective? No, it wouldn't be. We know that there are so many parameters and metrics involved with this process, and we know that it works. We know that you keep adding things to it, it'll continue to work. The problem is we assume that they all work to add to the collective benefit of this process. And what we're going to do is dismantle some of that information with part one and part two because it really isn't the case. There are a couple critical aspects that really make this better, but not all these pieces work. Does stro uh, stroke therapy get better um, since we started stroke centers? Yes, and the initial thrust was thrombolytics with stroke. When you think about 1% of stroke patients getting thrombolytics, 13% of those who are eligible getting it, are thrombolytics making the difference in stroke care? No, they aren't. It's our emphasis on stroke management. And that's what's happened with sepsis. We now have early goal-directed therapy for sepsis. We are focused on this. In the emergency department, if we're going to manage this for six hours, we are jumping on this. But does that mean that really all the parameters or the treatment that we're providing is that much better than the parameters we were providing before, not necessarily we're providing them differently? Before we get too deep into this, we've got to look at the definition so we know how to apply early goal-directed therapy. Well, you've got to have systemic inflammatory response syndrome to be able to have sepsis. And you add systemic inflammatory response syndrome with an infection, and you have sepsis. You need at least two of the following to get SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Temperature over 38.3 or less than 36, heart rate over 90, rest rate of 20 or over 20, white count between 4 or 12,000 or less than 4 or over 12,000, acutely altered mental status, or hyperglycemia in a non-diabetic patient. Now, my question and my concern, my question for you and my concern about this process is, have you ever sent a patient home with systemic inflammatory response syndrome? Yes, every day. Absolutely. Every day you do. So are these patients really early goal-directed therapy sepsis patients? Early on with this process, I am fairly certain that people with influenza and people with Viral, other viral syndromes and people with strep pharyngitis were getting central lines and a lot of fluid. It doesn't make sense. So be careful. That's one of the initial problems with this, that if you apply the definition of SIRS, a lot of people who really aren't septic and who really aren't that sick meet the definition. All right, severe sepsis is who we're looking at because that's who we're going to apply early goal directed therapy to. Severe sepsis is sepsis, so SIRS with an infection along with at least one organ dysfunction. And we know that you can have multi-organ dysfunction syndrome mods, but just one organ is all you need for severe sepsis. Here are some examples for you. Respiratory, newer increased O2 requirement to maintain a SAT of greater than 90, a creatinine that's greater than 2.3, or in SI units, um, 177 or greater, bilirubin greater than 1.98, coagulation, platelets less than 100, INR greater than 1.5, and tissue hypoperfusion. You can look at physical parameters, but also if you've got a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a mean less than 65, or a reduction of uh, blood pressure greater than 40 in someone's normal blood pressure if somehow they know it. So if it's a reduction of that length or that amount, 
lactate greater than two. And lactate's a test we're using now that's more, more beneficial to us than we thought it was in the past. How many of you forego the lactate and just wait for the CO2 on the basic metabolic panel? I think it's a great question. I, looked at, I used to do this. I looked into this about a year, year and a half ago. The problem with that is the lactate will rise much earlier than the CO2 will fall in the basic metabolic panel. So if you're not ordering the lactate and you're just waiting for the CO2 in the basic metabolic panel, you are going to miss sick people. So I'd recommend you go ahead and change your, your practice that way. All right, the next term, septic shock. If they remain hypoperfused after you give them fluid challenges and boluses, well, and they're still hypoperfused, look at oliguria, mottled skin, whatever it is, or the parameters that we talked about for, for a, an organ dysfunction, despite your efforts, to fluid resuscitate them, then they're in septic shock. They have poor cellular perfusion. All right, so what is early goal-directed therapy? I mentioned it. We look at the, the landmark paper from Manny Rivers, 2001, New England Journal of Medicine. They looked at all these bundled areas and decided that it really was better. You continued this in the ED for six hours versus standard therapy um, guided by CVP and mean arterial pressure and, and urine output, but with standard therapy, and they looked at the differences here. Remember, too, with goal-directed sepsis, they added the central venous O2 saturation measurements to make sure you're getting good cellular perfusion. They looked at 263 adults with severe sepsis, and this always makes me crazy. You look at the landmark studies that have changed the way we practice medicine and how many patients have influenced the way other patients are taken care of. 263 patients, that's it. So half of them got the therapy and half of them didn't. So let's take a look at this. In hospital um, mortality, 30.5% in the intervention group, 46.5% in the controls, 28-day mortality, 33 versus 49. In hospital death due to um, sudden cardiovascular collapse was twice as high in the controls as those with early goal-directed goal therapy. No doubt, as I mentioned earlier, this works. This is a good study, designed well. It's not a huge number of patients, but it did show a statistically significant difference, and we know that it works. The problem is when you dissect out the individual components, which is happening now with individual articles to say, what about steroids? What about tight glucose control? What about fluid resuscitation? What about pressors? Do all of these things really have the impact or is it just a couple of things? I'll be honest with you, from my perspective, some of them we just don't know. Some of them are clearly give us the biggest bang for the buck and others really don't work, but we're still doing them with this. All right, um, as far as this whole process moving forward, if you look at um, back around 2003 or so, remember Eli Lilly kind of was interested, 2001 to 2003, about selling this medicine called Zygris. Has anyone given a dose of Zygris? Good experience with that? Okay, didn't know the outcome, but that's an expensive medicine. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in part two, but basically, you know, it has anti inflammatory properties, anti thrombotic properties, pro fibrinolytic properties. So, you know, theoretically, we'd say it's probably a good thing with systemic inflammatory response syndrome. A lot of reasons why it isn't. What happened with Eli Lilly is they weren't selling this expensive drug, and it's really expensive. So they weren't selling it, so they came up, they actually hired a PR firm, and they started to develop this survival of sepsis campaign. And they, they put together a set of guidelines, including the delivery of Zygris, but a lot of it was based on the momentum that Manny Rivers had with his article. They just jumped on the back of that article and said, see, this is more, we're treating sepsis. And people said, oh, more sepsis stuff, we've got to do it. And initially, that drug was approved with very, very little data. All right. Um, a little more information for you. In um, 2008, in in published in Intensive Care Medicine, there were some recommendations made, um, and they kind of took a look at all of the components of goal-directed sepsis, and they used the National Health Service rankings for literature to decide what the level of support was and whether this was a strong recommendation or a weak one. And we'll go through these, and you can decide whether you think this is important for the success of early goal-directed sepsis or therapy. All right, number one, early goal-directed um, resuscitation during the first six hours after recognition. Well, they said it was a strong recommendation, you know, per the initial, original um, um, recommendations for early goal-directed therapy. What's the level of evidence? It's a C. You look at a level A is basically randomized controlled trials, great data. B, maybe some retrospective trials or cohort studies. C, basically not a whole lot of great data there a case series perhaps, and then D is just expert opinion. So level C, 
is, to, is the level of evidence that tells us we've got to do all of this within six hours. Blood cultures prior to antibiotic therapy, I guess we haven't learned our lesson with pneumonia and CMS. By supporting this, maybe that's why they haven't pulled it yet. All right, it was a, it was a strong recommendation, but still level C evidence. Imaging studies performed promptly to confirm source of infection. Strong recommendation of one, and again, level C evidence for that. Here's an important one, administration of broad spectrum antibiotics within one hour of the diagnosis of septic shock. It was a one, a good thing to do, and it's a level B evidence. Very good evidence, that's what we need to do. But in severe sepsis without septic shock, the, the level of evidence dropped to a D. Maybe it is still a good thing, there's just not enough evidence to say that we can prove that. Number five was administration of uh, crystalloid resuscitation, and that's a 1B. Strong recommendation with good data to support it. So right now, so far, our tally is with good data, strong recommendations are early antibiotics and early fluid resuscitation. Did we kind of know that before? We did. We just weren't doing it. All right. Fluid challenges to restore a mean circulating filling pressure. Let's say our target CVP of 8 to 12. That's a 1C. Still only level C evidence for that. Reduction in rate of fluid administration with rising filling pressures and no improvement in tissue perfusion. That's a 1D. It got a D. And no matter whose scale you're looking at, a D just sounds bad. We're all overachievers in this room. We can't have a D. We can't practice in the level D. All right, norepinephrine or dopamine to maintain target pressure, mean pressure greater than 65. Strong recommendation. They said you got to do it. Level C evidence. How about dobutamine, inotropic therapy? for those who don't have good cellular perfusion despite fluid resuscitation. They said you need to do it, but nonetheless, it's a level C recommendation with the evidence. Stress dose steroids, this is a 2C. It's not only a weak recommendation, something you shouldn't do. Um, there's some evidence, a level C evidence, to say that it's probably harmful and you don't want to do it. And then Zygris, it's a 2B. Bad, you know, bad recommendation, it's weak, don't do it. And the level of evidence is pretty good, a level B to say, it really is a bad thing to do, don't do it. Uh, the last one, which is a positive one, I think, in the absence of tissue perfusion or coronary artery disease or acute hemorrhage in sepsis, target hemoglobin of seven to nine is a good idea. It's recommended and it's also a level B evidence. So if you've got somebody who's septic, you can expect that they will not have good cellular perfusion if they have no red cells to carry the oxygen. So you've got to make sure, and that's not aggressive, who maintain a hemoglobin 7 to 9. Would anyone here want to function with a hemoglobin in the range of 7 to 9? Especially not here after traveling from somewhere else. Boy, you wouldn't be able to function very well. All right, we're going to jump into the abstracts here. Before I get going, um, everybody's here who makes a difference at this point, so I'll make this announcement. You guys saw the panel yesterday. We'll do a similar panel today, and then um, the next day, We'll do a couple different panels that are generated, um, generating discussion from, from questions that you will raise to the panel. The first one is going to be questions you put on this form, the salmon form, and the last day is the blue form, okay? And uh, not the last day, but the last day of the, uh, of the panels. The first one is improving operational efficiency in emergency medicine. So fill these out and give them to Mark out front. And the last one is diagnostic and therapeutic controversies. You have a question, you have a concern, you have a statement, whatever it is, jot it down. You can sign it or not sign it. And there's usually a little door prize that goes along with one that after each panel in those two days, we will select one of them. So it's uh, a good idea to put your name on it. We usually won't mention your name unless you're a winner. So make sure you fill those out if you can. All right, you ready to get into the abstracts? Oh, you cleared your throat. That's enough. I can, I can go with that. Okay. What are the key, the key factors related to antibiotic use and sepsis outcomes? You know, the two key factors are really timeliness and appropriateness of antibiotics, and that's the important thing. And we'll look at the literature, how it reflects to those two questions. What's interesting is despite there being a good number of articles on it, all of these articles and abstracts, which are really the good ones out there, really only rise to level D level of evidence. So really a lot of expert consensus, a lot of chart reviews, and a, not a lot of strong data. But is it harmful, if you're going to give it antibiotic anyway, to pick a good one? No. Is it harmful to say, if we're going to give it anyway, should we just give it earlier? No. So let's see how important it is. <clears throat> Abstract number one. Uh, this came out of uh, Critical Care Medicine, December 2003. 406 patients with sepsis admitted to the ICU. 
Adequate antibiotics were given an 84 percent. Mortality was 39 versus 64 percent of those who got inadequate antibiotics. So for us in the emergency department, we need to start with broad spectrum antibiotics. That's the key. We're not going to pin down necessarily the source of infection or the sensitivities while we're in the ED, so make sure we have it covered. Abstract number two, clinical infectious disease, January of 2004. They looked at the adequacy of empiric antibiotic treatment versus mortality. In adequacy in uh, over 2,600 hospital admissions with sepsis, 91% adequate antibiotics mortality. Um, at 28 days, 33% in the adequate group, 43% in the inadequate group. There was a difference here. And they, they basically said the greatest benefit was in septic shock. And that's where that recommendation came from. They're in septic shock. You need to get the antibiotics on board more quickly. That's not an unreasonable thing to ask. All right, number three, February 2008. It's a smaller study. They looked at 87 patients on both treatment arms, one inadequate antimicrobial therapy and 87 patients with adequate therapy. These were based on the cultures later to determine if they were adequate, not if they got better. And they were matched for all their demographics and the, the characteristics of their infection and their clinical presentation. They were pretty well equal. Inadequate coverage, ICU mortality rate was 58.6%. Hospital uh, for adequate coverage, 27.6%. So again, it strongly implies that adequate coverage makes a difference. Hospital mortality, 67.8 versus 28.7. Not just the ICU, but once they're transferred out of the ICU and they're in the hospital, it still made a difference. Those people did better. All right, ICU length of stay, 11 days versus 7 days. You'll spend less money, you'll stay in the hospital a shorter period of time with better antibiotic choices. Hospital length of stay, 32 days versus 17. So you get out and have better food. You can have the, the Siamese um, you know, stir fry earlier if you get the better antibiotics and get home and have your own food. So use of broad spectrum antibiotic coverage early on is very important is their conclusion. Number four is important, Annals of Emergency Medicine, November 2008. This was a Cochrane database review for evidence-based emergency medicine. They looked at 43 randomized controlled trials, beta-lactams versus a beta-lactam and an aminoglycoside. You're going to throw maybe gentamicin on board with this. And there was no reduction in all-cause mortality by adding the aminoglycoside. It's kind of interesting. And even in a subset of gram-negative infections, there was also no benefit in doing so. If you, interestingly enough, if you had a non-urinary source, a non-urinary source, the, you reduced the clinical failure rate with monotherapy. So the clinical failure rate was better with monotherapy. Interesting. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I don't think you'd hurt things by adding an additional antibiotic, but it appears based on their data, they're implying that you do. By adding the additional antibiotics, did you create any problems? Well, there was no increased resistance reported, but it's short term but there was an increase in nephrotoxicity by adding the aminoglycoside. So what they're saying in abstract four was, aminoglycoside didn't help, but it may cause nephrotoxicity. All right, number five, Kumar from Critical Care Medicine, June 2006. Now he talked about the timing of antibiotics, a little bit different, based on the onset of hypotension. So once the patient is hypotensive, when did you give the antibiotics? 2,514 patients with septic shock, Mortality rate, if they had effective antibiotics after hypotension, was 58%, fairly consistent with what we know about septic shock. We know the number is around 50% mortality rate. Okay, but interestingly enough, that decreased by 7.6% each hour of delay for the first six hours. So it was really important to give this subset of patients their antibiotics as early as possible. First 30 minutes, um, 83%. 77 um, uh, uh, in the second, 77% in the second 30 minutes, dropped to 42% five to six hours after hypotension onset. It is important. There is a significant decrement um, if you don't give the antibiotics quickly and early enough in, um, in septic shock, particularly with hypotension. All right, what vasopressor should be used in septic shock? Unresponsive to fluids. What do you guys like? Where are the norepinephrine people? You're over here. We can have you move if you want. Do you want to? If there's not a bond with you people, it's just what you're choosing. Okay, how about epinephrine? Just epinephrine. <coughs> Nobody for that. How about the dopamine people? No, it's about equal. And that's about what the literature reflects, too. We don't know. Here are the three issues, and we'll go through the, the abstracts here. We don't know if one's better than another, and we don't know if any vasopressors improve outcome whatsoever. The data does not prove that. So let's look at uh, number six.
epinephrine versus norepinephrine and dobutamine, 330 patients, 19 French ICUs. The goal was a mean arterial pressure of 70 or greater. That was their primary, and the primary outcome was 28-day all-cause mortality. Um, they had 40% um, with the epi group and 34% with a norepi and dobutamine group. No statistical difference there, not a huge number of patients. So they're stating, at least implying here, that those two groups, there was no difference there. Number seven, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Let's compare those. 280 adults, four ICUs requiring vasopressors, and they randomized them for epi or norepinephrine. Um, their primary outcome was a mean arterial pressure of 70 and maintenance of that for 24 hours without a presser once they got it up. Baseline characteristics of the patients, there were no differences. A few patients um, were withdrawn uh, from the epi group just because of tachycardia and some other symptoms they had, and that's a little bit problematic with this study as well. Median time to achieve the goal, there was no difference, 35 hours versus 40 hours. And the mortality rates, favored epinephrine, but there was no statistical difference there. 28-day mortality, 22.5 versus 26.1. What this does tell us is probably about in between five and 10 years ago when people, when the pendulum was swinging and people were saying, no, wait a minute, norepinephrine is definitely better. It's not gonna kill your kidneys. If you get better overall pressures, you'll perfuse the kidneys better. Norepinephrine is superior. This article is really calling that into question. At least it's comparing it to epi and not dopamine, but the same concept is, is really uh, applicable there. Abstract number eight, February 2009, critical care medicine, larger study, 897 patients with sepsis. It wasn't randomized controlled. This was treatment uh, based on physician discretion. They were treated with norepinephrine or dopamine. This is the one that you're probably really interested in. And uh, septic shock, 51% of the 458 patients. Norepinephrine, 73% uh, of the patients got that. Not surprising because the docs probably felt this is probably the better agent for them. Dopamine, 50% of the patients. And uh, mortality for norepinephrine was 52%. For dopamine was 38.5%. And use of norepinephrine was an independent predictor for mortality. So does norepinephrine kill people? Or did the physicians just select out sicker people to give it to? And I think that's probably the case. We don't have that answer, but we have to plant that seed of doubt. Because if you just take this on its face, you might say, wow, norepinephrine is not only not better, it hurts people. Well, no, you're probably selecting sicker patients. So you have to be a little bit careful. They also did a little spin-off here and looked at some steroid use. The trend of increased mortality was noted in those who did not receive low-dose steroids in, in septic shock. It's interesting, but the, the study design really wasn't focusing on that. We have to be careful what we do with that information. And fortunately, we'll talk about the abstracts regarding steroids in a little bit. All right, March 2007, Annals of Emergency Medicine. What vasopressors should be used to treat shock? This is the answer that we need. Evidence-based emergency medicine review from the Cochrane database, these are very helpful. They looked at eight studies that addressed this issue. There were only eight, and only seven of the eight really specifically dealt with sepsis. They looked at vasopressors to placebo, one vasopressor to another, another vasopressor, and pressors versus IV fluids alone. And it was helpful, but there was a trivial benefit for norepinephrine with dobutamine versus epi in two studies, trivial benefit for norepinephrine versus dobutamine in three, trivial benefit versus uh, uh, placebo versus vasopressin. So vasopressin definitely wasn't helpful in two studies. This is all inconclusive. And what this tells us is, we really don't know which is better. You can choose whichever you want. You probably want to choose something if you've tried aggressive fluid resuscitation and they're not responding, you want to use something. But this data also says that there's not enough information out there to say that pressors change anything. And we may find out down the road when there's a large enough randomized controlled trial that fluids are all you can do. And if they don't get better with that, they're just not going to get better. And maybe that's the case. All right. Oh, one thing I want to mention too, the scary thing is when people are at your hospital and elsewhere assessing your performance and compliance with early goal directed therapy, the use of pressors, the timing, and the choice is oftentimes one of the metrics they look at. But there's no data to support which you should use and if you, you should use any, except for that early um, paper on early goal directed therapy. So it's kind of concerning when we have to be held to a standard, much like blood cultures and community acquired pneumonia that really doesn't have much evidence behind it, but we're held to that standard. All right, what is the role of physiologic steroid doses in the treatment of sepsis? Not high dose. High dose steroids were studied, and it's a bad thing. It hurts people. What happens to those people? Their length of stay goes up. More of them die. They have more complications, and the cost of their care goes up. High dose steroids in sepsis is a bad thing. It really is. We're looking for that anti-inflammatory mediator in sepsis. We think that inflammation and sepsis is a bad thing, 
but maybe it's there for a reason. Maybe we shouldn't be treating it. Zygris, as we'll talk about, isn't the answer. NSAIDs were looked at many years ago. Those aren't the answer. And we're finding now that corticosteroids, high dose, is not the answer. So is physiologic or low dose the answer? It's probably not the answer either. But let's go through this and you make up your own mind um, regarding how you feel about this. Abstract number 10. Critical care medicine, January of 03. He said the cortisol levels greater than 18 is really a normal adrenal response to stress. So that's a good thing. 25 may be more reliable. I don't know where they came up with that number, but they buffered it a little bit, said, well, let's just go with 25. And they looked at a baseline greater than 25. If you just had that number, can you just do a spot cortisol test and not have to do a stim test? Is that helpful? And it did give them some information. Versus a low-dose stim test, one microgram of corticotropin, or the standard stim test. And what they found, small number of patients, 59 patients, was that uh, the baseline cortisol was 14 in patients who responded to steroids, 33 in those that did not. They had a huge response initially to their, to their sepsis or their stress. They probably weren't going to respond. Not a surprise. Steroid responsiveness, 95% had a cortisol less than 25. So if you've got a spot cortisol and they're less than 25, they're likely to be a steroid responder if you feel that steroids are going to be beneficial in this disease process. And you look at the others, the low-dose testing, 54%. Um, you know, would res uh, the responders had a positive test, and in the standard test, 22% of the steroid responders had a positive test. That's telling us those two tests, they're a little bit cumbersome, don't get the results right away. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's really like scientific for us. It doesn't really give us much good information. All right, number 11 is a meta-analysis that came out of in, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, July of 04. And they, rec they recognize that early studies of a high dose um, for inflammatory response for sepsis really increased mortality, not a good thing. But they also recognize that there's a relative adrenal insufficiency with sepsis. There is. That exists. What people have done is taken that leap and saying, well, if, if that's the case, then we must go ahead and provide steroids. It must be a good thing. Here's a great corollary. How many of us are still giving bicarb routinely for all metabolic acidosis? In patients who are not arrested, you know, we can, we can look at multiple, multiple um, disease entities of metabolic acidosis. We used it forever because well, you know, if they're acidotic and this is in their system already, then we assume that exogenous bicarb will work the same as endogenous bicarb. We don't need to study this, just start giving it. So that train, you know, left the station for many, many years, decades. Finally, people started to study that in the early 90s and decided, you know what? This doesn't work the way we thought it would work. And we really, although we expected it would work and we should give it, we really don't need to give it in most cases. So what they looked at was NIH meta-analysis. There were five trials after 1997 with physiologic steroid doses, 200 to 300 um, per day for five to seven days. And there were nine trials of high dose before 1989. Improved survival versus decreased survival, that's what they were looking at. And that's what we want to know. Is it improving outcomes? There was a linear decrease in survival as the dose increased. Make the dose higher, more people die, OK? Decreased need for vasopressors noted in the physiologic doses. That's where they said, well, you know, this is 2004. Maybe a lower dose is beneficial. So they found that, like I said, decreased need for pressors if you gave them a smaller dose of steroid. So the momentum started moving in that direction. And physiologic doses indicated um, with uh, vasopressor-dependent septic shock was their final conclusion. So at that time, that sounded like a good idea. But let's look at the rest of the abstracts here and see if you still believe that. Number 12, systematic review, August 2004, meta-analysis. They looked at um, um, low-dose, longer therapy, 300 milligrams a day for 5 to 11 days for adrenal insufficiency, and they thought it might be more favorable. They looked at 16 randomized control trials. Listen to this, in between 1955 and 2003, and I haven't pulled that 1955 article. I'm having a feeling that the level of the evidence is not that great. But severe sepsis and septic shock, the relative risk of mortality was a little bit higher, 0.97 for um, uh, short course high dose versus the longer low dose of 0.8. So all this really tells us is if you're going to use one, the lower dose is probably a little safer. And with the lower dose, there was no increased risk of GI bleed, superinfection, or hyperglycemia is what they found in this study. But they were looking at previous studies. And you always have to wonder a little bit about what the methodological design was of those studies. All right, number 13, uh, this is an implicit chart review. And uh, they stated a decreased response to the STEM test in uh, septic patients is associated with high mortality rates. Again, we know they have depressed cortisol and, depressed, and they have depressed adrenal function. We know that. 
The question is, what are we supposed to do about it? Is it a marker for bad disease? Do we all agree with that? If you have bad disease, is your adrenal fun uh, function suppressed? Yes, but is it a mediator? Meaning, do we need to do something about it so we can make things better? We're finding that hyperglycemia happens when people are in, in, under physiologic stress. That's really a normal response. Is it a good thing? Is it a mediator? Do we need to drop that blood sugar? Well, the evidence is saying that maybe we don't need to. Same thing here. I think this is more of a marker than it is a mediator. So they looked at 218 patients in septic shock. Despite the use of repeat fluid challenges and or inotropic support, 28-day ICU mortality, 22%. The fatal outcome patients had an increased illness severity scores on the day of their ACTH testing. Okay, not a surprise. They were sicker. ACTH response was not an independent predictor of mortality, which is good to know. 40% with fatal outcomes had limited response versus 20% in the survivors. So we know that people who are less sick have better adrenal response, but we still don't know if that adrenal suppression really causes worse outcomes. All right, and the next abstract, 14. Critical care medicine, June of 2008. Let's take a look at these quickly, and this is basically um, some recommendations from an internal task force from the American College of Critical Care Medicine, all ICU patients, not just sepsis, and um, they wondered what the role of testing was. Consideration of moderate dose steroid treatment and septic shock when there's a poor response, that was another one of the questions that they had. Fluids and vasopressors provided, and they said there's maybe a benefit irrespective of the response to the test. So don't do the testing, but if there's, a, but if there's you know, significant disease, maybe a low dose is beneficial. They really couldn't speak to that definitively. The last two articles really speak to the negativity of steroids, and they're pretty good articles. July 2005, and this was the Archives of Surgery, they know that low cortisol levels increase mortality. They state that 522 vasopressor-dependent critically ill patients were looked at. And baseline cortisol at ICU admission and an IV um, hydrocortisone at the discretion of the physician was their study design. 47% received steroids. Less than 15, um, the cortisol level, showed that they had a decreased mortality. Okay, we already knew that. We knew that 25 number. An increase in nine or less after the stem test also had increased mortality, but only in men. And it doesn't even really make sense. I don't really think that men's adrenal glands are different than women's adrenal glands. There are differences, you know, the Venus, Mars thing. I don't think it's in the adrenal glands. So what they found was no mortality difference um, between steroids and not steroids. And they also found corticosteroid delivery based on the stem test, guided by the stem test, didn't change outcomes either. Good study to tell us you don't need to do the stem test and you probably don't need to do steroids. Number 16. January uh, 2008, New England Journal. 499 adult patients in septic shock, randomized double-blind prospective study, good quality study. IV hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams, Q6 hours for five days, then a taper over six days. And they looked at 28-day mortality, which is what we want to look at. 46.7% did not exhibit a response, and they had a worse outcome. There was no difference in 28-day mortality, 34.3 versus 31.5 in the placebo group. It didn't make a difference. But what did happen, there were complications with the hydrocortisone group. Superinfections, 33% versus 26%. New episodes of, of shock, 6% versus 2%. Hyperglycemia, 85% versus 72%. And hypernatremia, 29% versus 18%. This goes one step further, saying that bad things probably will happen if you go ahead and give steroids, even if they're not high dose. The final thing we'll talk about briefly here is whether Atomidate really makes a difference. Do you guys like Atomidate as an induction agent? Do you love Atomidate as an induction agent? Are you willing to cast it aside because there's some questionable doubt, and I mean questionable doubt, that it might have some transient adrenal insufficiency, knowing that all patients who are critically ill have adrenal suppression? Are you willing to get rid of your Atomidate? I, they haven't been able to pry it out of my hands at this point. And let's look at, let's look at the data on this. Abstract number 17. Archives of surgery, 137 trauma patients, they did a stem test, a non-response in 39.4. So the non-response, 39% 39 of the patients were really sick. And they said the responders versus non-responders, characteristics of the patients were the same. Vasopressor dependent, 78% um, versus 52% um, with um, mortality rates. Exposure to Atomidate, 71% versus 52%. So the patients who got exposed to Atomidate really were more likely to have worse outcomes, more likely to be sicker with more adrenal suppression. Does that make sense to us, though? Do we intubate the less sick patients or the more sick patients? 
or just whoever we want to when we're bored. We probably go with the sicker patient. So Atomidate's taken a bad rap in this article because the sicker patients get Atomidate. All right, abstract 18, we're almost there. 18 and 19 are important. They were both published in Annals, almost side by side, July 2008. You have two principals who are in this argument. You can pick whoever you like, Ron Walls and Al Sacchetti. Who are the Ron Walls people for this argument? I'm kind of with him. Who are the Al Sacchetti people? Does anyone know Al Sacchetti? Okay, yeah, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And I love his heart with this, but I just can't go along with him. Here's what Ron Wall says. Hey, these are largely hypothetical concerns. Critical ill patients have decreased cortisol levels. We know that. And because of a transient increasing likelihood of maybe further adrenal suppression, do we really want to get rid of Atomidate, knowing that even when you, when you drop the cortisol level after giving Atomidate, it's still within normal levels. It doesn't drop below normal levels. Based on that data, are we willing to get rid of Atomidate? For me personally, the answer is no. Al says, wait a minute. Sepsis can produce adrenal insufficiency, and one single dose can have adverse, uh, adverse effects. Although, if you look back at Ron's um, editorial, he said there's not one case that has ever supported that one dose has caused mortality in that situation. And Al says, well, fine. If we didn't have other agents, we'd stick with Atomidate. But we've got propofol. Do you want to start using propofol for RSI? Hmm, maybe it's a great drug. How about methylhexatol? I don't want to be in the same room with that drug. It scares me. Ketamine, at this point, after, after uh, using Atomidate for RSI, I'm impatient with ketamine. Unless it's severe bronchospasm, I mean, you give the ketamine for, for an induction dose, and I'm like, I'm ready to have lunch and come back. It's just way too slow at this point. Midazolam, an induction dose, I don't like it. A lot of hypotension. So he says, why take the chance with Atomidate? I think we can. In the final abstract, number 20, January 2009, non-randomized prospective observational study of 106 patients with sepsis. A variety of induction agents were used, lots of them. They compared Atomidate versus any other agent that was used. Mortality rate was 38% for Atomidate, 44% for any of those other agents combined. There was no statistical difference with those patients. So what they said with this most recent article, January 2009, is, Atomidate isn't killing anybody. Keep using it if you want to. Thanks, everybody.